This is Patristic Theology Part 2. Last time we focused on kind of the uh, beginnings of the development of Christian doctrine as it moved out of um, the, the first century. As the church began to grow, we talked about things like canon formation, uh, apostolic succession, and we started to get into talking about uh, the person of Jesus Christ and Christology and how uh, beliefs about Jesus really kind of begin to define or help the church define what it is that the church uh, believes. So we start today by talking about uh, another council. So we talked about the Council of Nicaea. It talked about um, Jesus being of the same substance as the Father, and really establishing Jesus is begotten. It combated Arianism, um, but begins to kind of lay the ground in, in some ways for a doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and the Council of Chalcedon is, is further kind of clarifying what the church believed about this person named, named Jesus. Now, again, we have to see these issues as salvation issues. Um, as we saw with Athanasius, um, God is the one who saves, so the focus is God's action, but it's about the restoration of humanity. And so in Jesus, there has to be fully God and fully human. But then the question is, how, do, how are these things related? So the Council of Chalcedon is, is addressing some of these issues um, and taking on um, some of the, the what were believed to be false beliefs about the person of Jesus Christ. The Council takes place in 451. Um, it becomes kind of a defining thing about what it means to believe in, in Jesus and, and to have faith and who this person is and focuses on the nature and person of, of Jesus Christ. Now, what were the different views that were kind of floating around? Well, the, the first one is, is Apollinarianism. And this is um, based upon a guy from, from Alexandria. And there are two kind of um, places in in the, the early church where the the different ideas about uh, the humanity and divinity of Christ develop. One is Alexandria in Egypt, which tend to focus on the divinity of Christ. The other is Antioch, which kind of uh, tends to focus more on the humanity of, of Christ. And so you get people from these different kind of perspectives. Apollinarianism um, emphasized that, the, it put an emphasis on the divinity of Jesus, and what it did is it said that, that, that Jesus is body, soul, spirit. So this kind of three um, part um, to the human being. Uh, so they would say that all of us are a body, soul, and, and spirit. But the difference here is that with Jesus, the body and soul are human, but the spirit is divine, is, is the Christ, is, is the Logos. Um, and so you get this three-part human being, only one of the parts then is, is uh, fully divine. Now, Nestorianism um, is, is based upon the Antiochian emphasis upon the humanity of Christ. And there's a sense of wanting to preserve kind of the, the, the natures. So the focus here is that Christ is two natures, uh, fully human and fully divine. And these are distinct and, and separate. Um, in, in two kind of hypostasis. And, and so think of it in, in the terms of wanting to so protect the divinity and the humanity of Jesus that these things are kind of separated out and, and the emphasis is on the division between these two things. Now the Monophysites uh, wanted to say that Christ is one nature, one hypostasis, one, one person, um, fully divine and fully, fully human. Now, all three of these get uh, rejected, actually, at Chalcedon. Now, what's interesting is you can find pockets of them still around. So, for example, this picture I have on the screen is uh, of a Monophysite church in uh, the Middle East, um, in uh, Syria, I believe, um, where they will still hold to this notion that, you know, Christ is, is one, one nature, I mean, and, and one person. So one way to, to think about um, this whole issue is a question of, um, take a dog, for example. So you talk about a purebred, a purebred dog. So let's say you take a purebred golden retriever and a purebred German shepherd. Now, when the two come together and mate, what is the puppy going to be? Um, well, we would call it a mutt. We would say that it's a third thing. It's, it's uh, 
It's part golden retriever, part German shepherd, but now it becomes this third thing. All of these, these attempts to articulate the divinity and humanity of Jesus are attempts to deal with that kind of difference. If you get the divinity and humanity that come together in the person of Jesus, is Jesus a third thing? Um, is, there two, is there two persons, a divine person of the Trinity and the, and the human person Jesus? Um, or is it just one person? Is, is there a sense, you know, if you think of the Monophysites, it's just one person, uh, fully divine, fully human, one, one nature. Um, these are the issues and questions, if you think about it in terms of, of a dog and a mutt and mixed breed and all that kind of stuff, that we're really dealing with. And again, the attempt is to protect humanity and divinity in the sense of thinking about God's action in the divinity and salvation in the terms of God's action and, and the restoration of humanity and, and creation. So they're wrestling through these different ideas of who the person of Jesus Christ is. So what does the, the council decide? Well, they come up with what is called the Chalcedonian definition. So let me read it, and the language is kind of archaic. And again, for us, it maybe doesn't make a lot of sense, but um, th this is uh, hopefully the language you you'll see what they're trying to say. So it says this, we then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, so divinity and humanity, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, so fully human, in all things like us, unto us, without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, so fully God, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, mother of God, humanity, Theotokos is the word that they would say, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union. So we're not just mixing up the divinity and humanity, right? But rather the property of each nature being preserved. So think about the, the Nestorians. They're wanting to preserve the natures, but they did it in a way that was two natures, almost two kind of persons, um, two hypostases, um, being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same son, and only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. So what you're getting here in the Chalcedonian definition is a recognition of two natures, and notice they're kind of saying what Jesus is not, right? Um, uh, it's two natures, fully divine, fully human, not mixed up together to create a third thing. But it's one person, um, one subsistence. So two natures, one person. This is what they're trying to say about the person of Christ. Now, again, for us, we might say, why all this hand-wringing? Um, what does it matter? We believe Jesus is God. We believe Jesus is human. God saves us from our sin. You know, let's just be content with that. But what they're doing is they're trying to protect from heresy. And they see this as a salvation issue which is why they take the time, the painstaking time, to give this definition. Now, this leads us into a doctrine of the Trinity. So if we talk about the person of Christ being fully God and fully human, eternally begotten, again, the doctrine of the Trinity then flows out of an understanding of who Jesus is. So that first line there, I'm, I say it's connected to beliefs about Jesus Christ. So what then is the relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Um, and, and how then does the worship of Jesus Christ as being divine or being God maintain a form of monotheism? Now, one person who addressed this was, um, was Tertullian. And Tertullian is Western. He uses legal, kind of lawyer-like language. And one of the things that he emphasizes as you deal with the three-in-one and by the way, Tertullian is someone from whom we kind of get the language of the Trinity. What he says is this, that the monarchy or the kingdom 
do not have to be held by one person. So if you think of, of, of a kingdom, right, and if you think of a king and a queen and, and a prince or princess, in some ways what you have there are three persons who are a part of or have the right to the one substance that is the kingdom. So think of England, right? So you have the queen, you have the, the prince, um, right? And, and what it's saying is the kingdom, right? The substance is the kingdom, the property, uh, the one, the, the right to the property. And the persons then are the different people, the queen, the king, and, and so on. So there you begin to get this notion of the three persons, one substance, Right? So person in this context is a legal person who has a certain right to something. And so what Tertullian argues is that God is, is one substance, one, and we're going to talk about this more here in a little bit, but one usia, one being uh, manifested in three persons. Um, so again, the three persons, one substance, one nature, one usia, one being is the language that Tertullian um, provides. And so Tertullian um, provides kind of a way of thinking about what is often called the divine economy, right? So this, re this relationship, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father eternally begetting the Son. Um, so there is no time when the Son was not. So in, in most Father-Son relationships, as Arius was trying to say, there's a time when the Father exists and the Son doesn't. But if the Son is eternally begotten, then there is no time when the Son does not exist. It speaks to relationality, which we'll get to here uh, in a little bit. And so again, the emphasis for Tertullian is really the oneness. In fact, in other places, um, Tertullian is also kind of interpreted as using kind of theater language and the persona, the masks of the theater, um, the, the same character, the same person plays three characters by donning different masks. Now that's that's problematic because it kind of gets into modalism, where the you know the idea that God is Father and then God is Son and then God is Spirit, and that's not what the doctrine of the Trinity is trying to say. Um, the doctrine of the Trinity here is trying to talk about the threeness, the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the one substance of, of Godness. Now, the other um, place where we get a really kind of an emphasis on the Trinitarian stuff is from um, the Eastern uh, Church and what are called the Cappadocians or the Cappadocian Fathers, although it's important to recognize that they had a sister. So um, Basil and Gregory, uh, Basil the Great, uh, Basil of Nyssa, Gregory of Nyssa are brothers, and they had a sister named Macrena who uh, is also was a big part of this. And then there's Gregory of, of Nanzius. Um, now the emphasis here is really interesting. Whereas Tertullian seems to be emphasizing the oneness, the Eastern Fathers are emphasizing, the, in, in some sense, the threeness and wanting to emphasize the relationality that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we get this sense that the Son is begotten and eternal. The eternal generation or the eternal be. be um, begetting of the Son. And this is also where we get the language of procession. So if we go back to the Nicene Creed, what does the Creed say? It talks about the Son is being begotten, and then it talks about how the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Now in the West, they added, and the Son, which was very controversial. Because in the East, the focus is on and the differentiation between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is grounded in that relationality. Um, the Son is eternally begotten, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. And so again, you get this divine community. So over here, we have a picture of the icon for the Trinity in the East, which is the picture of the three angels who, who come to the visitors who come to, to visit Abraham. And again, there's an emphasis on threeness. Now, what I would also want to say to you here is this is where the Trinity um, isn't just some, you know, abstract thing. 
What's fascinating to me is how the doctrine of the Trinity actually begins to speak to the nature of reality. Increasingly, social sciences, natural sciences, are emphasizing relationality and identity. Um, that, that who we are is grounded in the relationality that exists between the created world and people and so on. Neuroscience right now seems to be suggesting that we are wired to go outside of ourself to encounter the other and that our, our neural pathways are, are ingrained in, in this way. So the doctrine of the Trinity is more than just abstraction. It actually speaks to the practical nature of reality, I would argue, especially in the ways that the Cappadocian fathers are, um, and, and, and Mark Rana are, are speaking of this. So again, it's, it's about relationality. It's about community, that God exists as a divine community. And here we get uh, usia, the being, the universal, general, godness, and hypostasis, which is particularity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the same way, we participate in the, 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 the usia of humanity. We are of the same substance. Of, we are all human beings, but we are always particular human beings. And we are always one at the same time, human in a universal sense, but also human in a particular sense. We are, are in individually our own human beings. And we only know that by being in relationship to one another. It's our differences with one another that helps us recognize that. So again, the doctrine of the Trinity is not just some abstract thing we kind of lay over everything. You know, there are some Christian communities that want to get rid of the doctrine of the Trinity. They don't see it as biblical. I see it as very biblical. Genesis 1, you know, in the beginning, you have God who speaks into existence creation and the spirit of God hovering over the water. So think about the eternal word that is spoken that brings creation into existence and the spirit then that forms and shapes and, and sustains that creation. So all through scripture we find the doctrine of the Trinity and what, what these um, early church people are doing is trying to unpack the biblical revelation of God in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit using their own language and categories. So again, this is where the, the idea of language comes into, is really important. They're expressing it within a particular language. And now we have our own ways of speaking. What I would argue is let's not get rid of the doctrine of the Trinity as expressed by Tertullian and the Cappadocians, but we need to interpret it and have some understanding of it um, for ourselves. So you begin to see how the doctrine of the Trinity develops out of an understanding of who Jesus Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is, and this becomes a foundational doctrine of, of Christianity. Um, and I've just kind of talked about all of this. Uh, Gregory of Nat... Uh, um, I can never say his name very well. Uh, Nazanzius is is emphasizing this relationality and difference. And we've already talked about the Father begets the Son. The Son, uh, and this, I should say the Spirit, proceeds from the Father, not the Son, but uh, proceeding from the Father. Now, one other word that I think is important here is this idea of the perichoretic indwelling. There's an indwelling that takes place. So if we talk about God being three persons in community, this helps us understand what it means to say that God is love. And that the foundation of existence is love. All of creation comes into existence because of the love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this perichoretic indwelling is this notion of we are different, yet we are also in community with, uh, with one another. And so I think that that's uh, very important. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about Augustine. Um, right now, because we're going to spend a whole week on Augustine. You're going to read the Confessions, um, and you know we can spend some time on that. But uh, just to say, Augustine becomes an important figure. He, he takes kind of a Neoplatonic perspective and begins to bring Christianity into conversation with it. He deals with two controversies. One is the Donatist controversy. The Donatists were people who, um, there was a, a, an intense persecution that took place, um, in Christianity, and they were they were asking for people to um, uh, denounce the faith, renounce the faith, and uh, or they'd be persecuted. And so, what happened was there were priests who. 
for the sake of, of others, some of it might have been, you know, they were afraid and, and whatever, but there were some for whom they were trying maybe to protect other people. Um, so they renounced the faith, they let the scriptures be burned and, and tried to avoid suffering either for themselves or for others. Once the, the persecution was over, you had this whole group of people then who wanted to come back into Christianity. And the question was, what do you do with them? The Donatists were a very strict group who said in no way, shape, or form should these people be allowed back into the church. They were, they were almost a hyper-purity uh, movement, which they wanted to say that, that, uh, that sin and, and disobedience doesn't at all belong in, in the church. And Augustine opposed them. And this is where we kind of get this idea of the visible and the invisible church. Um, this is where Augustine showed grace uh, and mercy um, and, and really kind of fought against the Donatists in saying that, no, that these people should be, some of them should be allowed kind of uh, back, back in. And it raises all these questions about penance and, and baptism and all these types of things. Um, the other one is, is a Pelagian controversy, which really begins to focus on the question of, of human nature. Pelagius was uh, uh, someone in the, in the church who was arguing that all humans are created sinless. We all come into this world sinless. We're all like Adam, and we all have to make our own choice. Now, the reality is, is, is people don't live sinless lives because of the environment in which we come into. We come into an environment that is rife with sin, and so we pick it up and we learn it really, really quickly. Uh, but Pelagius was someone who, who was much more positive about kind of the human condition in the beginning and wanted to emphasize freedom. When Augustine fights against this, and this is where Augustine becomes known as someone really focused on the doctrine of election and total depravity, but what he, he's fighting against this and, and, and arguing that we, uh, in Adam, we have all sinned. And so therefore, our humanity has itself been warped. And that as we're born into this world, it's not just our environment that makes us sinful. There's something about our human nature that it has in and of itself been, been warped. Um, and, and so uh, Augustine kind of begins this conversation on election and, and pushes back against uh, Pelagius. Um, and then he wrote this, this book on this called The City of God, which tries to address the issue of Rome collapsing and, and the Romans were kind of blaming Christians and things like that. And um, he writes this, this big book trying to give kind of a, a, the, a, a theological interpretation of history and God's work in history and so on. Um, and we, we don't have a lot of time to dig into that one, but um, we'll spend time reading Augustine's Confessions. And the purpose of that is to try to show you how he was using kind of Platonist language, but at the same time, he pushes against the Platonist stuff to a certain degree. Um, right now, Augustine is huge in philosophy and, and theology. There's kind of a return to Augustine. Uh, and so we'll read his Confessions and unpack him there. Uh, the last person we'll talk about is Gregory the Great, who becomes kind of uh, an important pope when the western half of the Roman Empire falls, he kind of steps in and, and um, kind of takes charge. And you can make the argument that this is where the western Roman church really begins to put a lot of emphasis on the papacy, whereas the empire, the, the Roman Empire, continues in the east. Um, uh, it, it continues, the Byzantine Empire continues for a, a lot longer. Um, and so one of the ways to kind of think about the, the schism that we'll talk about at some point between the West and the East is to think about it in, in, in the terms of the West fell earlier than the East. But uh, Pope Gre uh, Gregory does a whole bunch of different things in the church. He, he begins to, to cultivate Gregorian chant, which becomes an important part of the, the life, liturgical life of the church. He writes a book on pastoral care. What does it mean to be a priest? What does it mean to be a bishop? And the tension is always between the active or the contemplative life and the active life. Um, so think of it in these terms. And, and again, we need to think in the kind of Platonic, kind of Greco Roman sense of detaching ourselves from the world to get to what is true and what is real. And so, in some sense, the monastic life begins to develop as a way. Um, to lead the, a contemplative life, a life of detachment, to come into union with God. What Gregory wanted to emphasize is that 
Priests and bishops needed to be both a part of the contemplative life and the active life. So think of pastoral care. Think of the preaching of the word and all of these things. So Gregory is someone who wanted priests uh, to, to be part of both and to take both very seriously. We'll come up with that in the Reformation when we, we talk about Luther and Calvin and, and so on and their pushback against the um, 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 monasticism and, uh, and so on. Um, also, what you begin to develop at this time is the beginnings of a sacramental system. Uh, so the Eucharist and baptism uh, are, are there very early, although they don't really begin to define what, you know, how is the bread and wine the body of Jesus, body and blood of Jesus, what is baptism. Early on, um, they believed that if you were baptism, baptized and then committed sins after your baptism, you, would, you, were, you had no hope. So people would put off their baptism until they were on their deathbed uh, to just try to you know, hedge their bets to make sure that they didn't fall. Now, eventually what happens is you, you get kind of a penitential uh, system of penance that develops to deal with post-baptismal sin. How do you deal with that? And so you kind of begin to see the development of these, these different systems. And so things like confession and penance and even the doctrine of purgatory begins to kind of be developed uh, during, uh, during this time. Now, we'll talk more about these things as we get into the medieval church and so on. Um, and, and really begin to talk about some of the Eucharistic stuff that's going on and how they begin to see things. And definitely when we get to the Reformation, we will uh, have to unpack you know, how the Reformers are seeing these things in, in the context of Scripture, but also in the context of the history of the Church. So hopefully this all made sense. You begin to see the development of different doctrinal beliefs, specifically what they understand about the person of Jesus Christ, and how they understand uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, two very foundational uh, doctrines for all of us who uh, claim to be Christians.